Peter, welcome to our morning service. Uh, welcome, and uh, can't uh, no body language now, is there, with these things on? Awful. Um, we just uh, thank God for this day, for Mother's Day, and we'll say more as we go through the service. Just the, the COVID matters, uh, codes of conduct. Yes, please wear masks as you're doing. Do register coming in if you haven't. And of course, uh, there's no morning tea, which is unfortunate, but there we are. We have a talk outside. And of course, they say no singing or dancing. So, um, um, so that is, uh, where's Greg? Greg uh, there we are. Greg. We've got a couple of things. take this up or it will fog up my spectacles. Uh, just a few announcements, friends, uh, and just to add uh, greetings to mothers uh, along with Jim's and perhaps uh, just to be uh, prayerful about uh, those who've sadly lost a child over the years as well on this, uh, on this day and the sadness that brings to them. Uh, there are four things. Uh, there's a farewell dinner for Roger and Sue. Uh, I don't know if you know them at all, but uh, it's just that's the names here. Uh, it's going to be held on Saturday, the 9th of June, from 6:30 to 10:30 p.m. at Barker College. Uh, $95 per person. Please book and pay online by the 5th of June, and you'll find all the information in Swiss Mail and at the back of the church. Uh, second, there's a special Mother's Day, mainly music, on Tuesday the 11th of May at 10 a.m. A special Mother's Day for mainly music in the hall. Uh, Blessed Assurance are coming on Thursday the 13th of May at 10.30 a.m. and that will be in the lounge and uh, others are welcome to come and join in that service there. And also the Women's Friday Bible Study will meet on the 14th of May at 10.30 a.m. Uh, in the Pace Centre. And uh, I think people are welcome to join if you don't already belong to that uh, Friday Women's Bible Study Group. Thanks, Jim. Good. And now we'll listen to our first hymn. Thank you. Thank you, choir.
we have some, as, as is required, sentence of scripture. What I'd like to do is express something about mothers and Mother's Day in the context of just our scripture, much better than I could ever do. Mother's love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, is not proud, is not conceited, does not act foolishly, is not selfish, is not easily provoked to anger, keeps no record of wrongs, takes no pleasure in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a garland for your head and a pendant for your neck. May your father and mother be glad, she who gave you birth rejoice. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And you made all of the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour on, John took her into his own home. And finally, a mother of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeing, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be appraised. Give her the reward she has earned. Let her works bring her praise at the city gates. And what does a mother say to these accolades? She says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. We think of today as mothers, of those who may have, have their wonderful children even a long way from here, and those mothers who have lost children, uh, and of course all of us who look on in awe at what the mother does and brings the family together. We are the people of God. The scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father who freely forgives us. So, let us draw near to God with confidence and pray together our confession on the first page of our sheet. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you, God more, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our God fulfills his promises and is true to his word. We have confessed our sins. God has forgiven us because...
Christ died for our sins. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He said his love endures forever. Now we listen to hymn number two. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us, showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The first reading from the Old Testament is Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. 
By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and he sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. He reigns the reading. Good morning. Please excuse my voice. It's a bit, bit of a frog in it this morning. Um, isn't it wonderful that we have five singers at the front? <laughs> we did plan to sing this anthem with a full choir because it's the perfect anthem for Mother's Day. We're sing about to sing all things bright and beautiful. The words are what is always the most important. And these are written by Cecil Francis Alexander, who was uh, born in Dublin in 1818. And so we've got words written by a woman about God's creation. What's more, she wasn't just a woman, she was a mother, a teacher, and went on to write so many of our favorite hymns because she wrote them for children so that we all understand them. Um, this morning, with our five wonderful singers who answered the call yesterday, we're not going to do the Rutter version, but the one that's in our hymn book, but the words in your outline do remain the same.
Today's New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 28. <coughs> the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, please give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, um, send, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. <coughs> so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country uh, and went um, uh, sent, and who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He, he longed to fill his stomach with the, the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to the father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called on the, ser on the servant to ask him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Here ends today's reading. Thank you, John. Now might we stand together and say the Apostles' Creed, which of course is what we're studying in our home groups and what we're going to hear from Paul Sampson in a short time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us sit or kneel for prayer. We 
say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Collect for the First uh, the fifth Sunday after Easter. Let us pray that we may practice the faith we profess. Ever living God, help us to celebrate joyfully the resurrection of the Lord and to express in our lives the love we celebrate. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A prayer for Mother's Day. Loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of family life. We especially thank you for all mothers and the love and care they bestow. We thank you for the blessing they are to us and for their example in the faith. We thank you for the gift of life they have given us and their nurture and care. We give thanks for their understanding, compassion, endless patience, willingness to listen, and boundless energy. Finally, we thank you for their unconditional love and support. We ask you to bless richly all mothers as they celebrate their special day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now pray together for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty God, we come before you today with our prayers of intercession for the nations of the world and for your church on earth. We pray for the leaders of the nations that you will give them wisdom and justice in their decisions. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the increasing availability of vaccines against COVID-19, and we pray this may continue and be extended to benefit poorer nations for the good of all. We pray for protection on all medical people and other frontline workers involved in caring for people infected and in quarantine. We commit to your healing love, the sick and those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. We pray for nations in conflict and for displaced people in refugee camps where the virus is continuing to accentuate the problems they already have. May practical solutions be found to alleviate the suffering. We pray for the people of Myanmar under tough oppression at present, Lord. We pray for our country, Australia, and our government our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, all state premiers and those in authority under them, that wise and just decisions may be made in these challenging times. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church throughout the world that unity and godly love may prevail for the glory of your name. Have mercy, loving Father, and turn hearts to yourself in repentance and faith in these times. We pray for Archbishop Kanishka Raffel as he settles into his new role, and for our regional Bishop Chris. We lift to you our mission partners in various places that they may all be sustained by your love, grace, and wisdom. This month, we pray for Heather Rose Newcomb and Fiona Newcomb in their ministry at Taramara High School as they reach out to students and teachers with your gospel of love and new life through Jesus. And today, we pray for Berkeley Life Church 
and its pastor, Wayne Pickford, as they work towards Jesus transforming lives to transform the community there. We pray for your blessing on your church here in Plimble, dear Lord, for Greg, Paul and Nigel and all others in authority and the volunteers. We pray for Roger and Sue as they seek your leading for the future. We ask for your guidance for the nominators as they search for your choice of a future rector for this parish. Also, we ask that you will bless us all with your compassion for each other as we face changes to come in our community. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, mourning the loss of loved ones or other adversity as listed in the Swiss mail and those known to us as we name them silently before you now. We pray for ourselves, dear Father, that we may truly believe and show forth in our show forth our faith in our lives. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. The wardens have um, something to uh, advise us about. Robin Hall is here to say something. a nice introduction. Robin Hall is here to say something. <laughs> this week you would have received, as I did, Core Matters, either electronically or in hard copy. It's a great way to see how we're travelling as a church family. Now if you worked your way through it, by the time you got to page 20, you were looking at a rather beautifully presented graph. This orange, green and blue graph tells us how we're travelling financially. The graph shows that our receipts are approximately 10% lower than budget as they were this time last year. This shortfall, interestingly, is across pretty well all services. At the same time, our costs have not decreased nor have the services that we're running, nor of the activities that we offer. We still need to fund them. The government funding that we received last year and cash boost support is not available this year. The wardens and the parish council, I can assure you, are managing costs carefully and cautiously. But there are still some very significant and urgent property expenses to meet right across all our properties. For instance, the slate roof on this building needs constant attention, as we see with the buckets around the place after heavy rain. Four Mary Vale and 4A Mary Vale need some quite extensive repair, costing tens of thousands of dollars. Our property at 11 Mary Vale might well need more than we expect to get ready for the new rector to move in. Praise God, the recent IT appeal was hugely successful thanks to your generosity. So we're not launching another appeal at this stage. As there's no cause for panic, we are in what's been called the alert, not alarmed stages. However, we are asking for you to prayerfully reconsider your giving. How long is it since you considered the level of your support for our parish? the beginning of the new year, last year, perhaps you've never really thought about it. We encourage you to please review your giving and if at all possible, to give via automatic bank transfers, either weekly or monthly. This simplifies the issue for you and it provides the parish with more certainty with budgeting. So we're confident that with the Lord's leading, we can rely on your support. We thank you. Thank 
you, Robin. Well, the Lord's been very good to us. He continues to be good always. And uh, we're just uh, mightily blessed here. May we together pray the offertory prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord God, our Father. Through your goodness, we have gifts to share to support this church, its missions and its efforts to welcome, nurture and serve those here and those around us. Accept and use all of our offerings for your glory and the service of your kingdom. Amen. And now our hymn, O God Beyond All Praising. Creed this morning. I've been thinking quite a lot about the Apostles' Creed recently and I have a problem with it. I think in our current form it doesn't really suit our contemporary context. I think it might be better if we softened it a bit. So I've written uh, a new creed, what I've called the New Millennium Creed and uh, here are the words of it. It goes like this, whilst respecting that your view may be different to mine, I personally think that on balance there is a reasonably strong possibility that there may be a God and that he or she is probably quite nice. <laughs> you can see this new creed has several advantages. Firstly, it's more politically correct. Secondly, it recognises that we live now in a pluralist society. It's less offensive and it is more inclusive. I can't see your faces. I hope you can see mine. I am not serious, of course. <laughs> but I want us to notice that an ambivalent, politically correct statement like this nonsense is categorically different to someone making a statement that says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven 
and earth. The Apostles' Creed is an exclusive claim, an exclusive truth claim, and its impact is far-reaching. We need to note, too, that making a statement such as the Apostles' Creed is potentially very dangerous. For the early Christians, as is the case for many Christians today, in many countries around the world, stating a belief in God is an exceptionally dangerous thing to do. To admit to being a Christian can mean arrest, imprisonment, torture, even death. Let me uh, give you a quote from the Voice of the Martyrs website. If you haven't looked at this recently, you might want to go there and just kind of do a check on what's happening around the world. The website says this, Throughout the world today, millions of Christians are experiencing persecution for the sake of Christ. Pastors are imprisoned or killed for proclaiming the gospel in their churches and villages. Young people flee for their lives when their families discover they have converted to Christianity. Believers are beaten, tortured, pursued. They are falsely accused, threatened, abused, starved, maimed and harassed. Their churches and homes are burnt down, their Bibles and Christian material confiscated and their businesses destroyed. They are expelled from school and college, fired from their jobs, treated as criminals and rebels, forbidden to evangelise and forced to meet and worship in secret. Friends, I've met brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, in Nigeria, for example. I've been to places where, walked around the ashes of where churches have been burnt to the ground. People have been arrested. All for believing the very things that we state we believe. Now, we praise God that in a country like Australia it is normally not a matter of life and death for most people. But be aware, there are people in our communities who suffer for believing the things that we say we believe, the things that we articulate in the Apostles' Creed. Historically, the Apostles' Creed was the profession of faith made by converts at their baptism and form the basis of their instruction. Note, there is a profound difference between saying, I have a belief in a God, and I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. There is more to faith, of course, than just giving verbal assent to believing in God. Faith at that level is immature, superficial, and hardly effective. Such faith leaves you vulnerable to doubt and of little use in evangelism. And here is part of the benefit of us over these next weeks, thinking deeply about these things. We need to think about them. It is difficult to explain the rules of rugby to someone else if you don't know them yourself. It is difficult to explain Christianity to an outsider if you haven't thought much about it yourself. Christians do indeed trust in God, but they believe quite definite things about him. And that, of course, has an impact upon us as believers. A creed then provides this summary of the Christian faith. It is never meant to be a substitute for personal faith. It gives substance to a personal faith that already exists. You do not become a Christian by reciting a creed any more than you become a Canadian by singing their national anthem. But a creed does provide a useful summary of the main points of our faith. Last week, you remember, we looked at these huge existential questions of Belief, belief in God. We looked at that key phrase, that beginning phrase, I believe in God, the triune, eternal God of the Bible, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three persons in one being. And we looked at the implications of individually believing that statement. 
Today, we focus on the first line of our Apostles' Creed that we said earlier. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And here's the big idea. God is the creator who rules over everything through his word. And he is also the Father who watches over his people in love. So first... God is the Father Almighty. Today, as we've mentioned several times, is Mother's Day, and then later on in the year, oh, happy Mother's Day to all the mums. Today, Mother's Day, later in the year, we celebrate Father's Day. When I was a child, I asked my mum, how come we don't have a Children's Day? <laughs> and she said, every day is Children's Day. And now that I'm a parent, I appreciate the truth of that. Here's the thing. I've never met your dad. But I know about him. I know quite a lot, really. And that may present a problem for you when you come to this part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. When we use the word Father, it is almost necessarily skewed by our own experience of our own earthly father. I've got a great dad, but your father may have been a tyrant, may have been a wretch, he may have left your mother and you as a child. If that's the case, I'm, I'm so sorry. An image like father, which is supposed to convey so much that is good, compassion and love and kindness and care and support, that word father may carry a lot of the opposite baggage for you. Now, whether or not the image of father is problematic for you based on your own father, we all need to remember this fundamental thing that all our human fathers are the same. They are flawed, sinful individuals. Absolutely, made in the image of God and at times able to demonstrate those characteristics that we should being made in the image of God. That kindness and love and compassion and forgiveness. If your earthly father is a Christian, he should show the fruit of the Spirit in his life. But he is also flawed, deeply flawed, as we all are. Let us not forget the reminder of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, where he reminds us there's no one righteous, not even one, regardless of whether your dad was or is a shining light in the community or a complete wretch, like me and like you, is sinful. So any comparison between him and our Heavenly Father can only actually work as a contrast. We went to the... uh, Australian National Museum yesterday had closed for a long time last year. They've renovated and now opened again. And part of what they had on display yesterday was a fabulous exhibition of photography. This was one of the pictures there. Look at this picture. You notice the wombat because of his contrast with the snow. Every earthly father is different from our heavenly father, at least as much as that wombat is from the snow. Categorically different. Remember, too, how often the scripture compares God to a human mother. In Isaiah, for example, the love of God for his people is compared to the love of a mother for her child. We see that in Isaiah 49 and 66. We get a closer picture of God the Father 
when we think of the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son, which was read for us a little early on. Think about the character of the father in that story that Jesus told. The father was generous and kind and loving and offered unconditional forgiveness, forgiveness that wasn't deserved. There, we get a much closer picture of what our heavenly father is like. But if we really want to get a good picture of what our Heavenly Father is like, we need to reflect upon Jesus' words in John chapter 14, where he said that he and the Father are one. If you see the Son, you see the Father. Our Heavenly Father knows every detail of our lives, all our achievements, sure, and all our failings. And this is the extraordinary thing. Even though he knows all our sins, he still loves us. Even though he knows all the details of our lives, he still loves us. Such is his extraordinary love. King David wrote of God in Psalm 63, Your love is better than life. Our Heavenly Father loves you so much that he didn't spare his only son for you. I was so glad we sang that uh, modern day hymn, that Stuart Townend hymn before, that captures so poignantly the Father's love. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch like me his treasure. First, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the loving Father for whom nothing is impossible, the Father who knows me and loves me and so long that I would be reconciled to him that he sent his son to die for me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Second, that he is the creator of heaven and earth. Psalm 33, which we also read before, weaves together three themes of God's creation, his reign, and his care of his people. We see that in verses 6 to 9, it's up on the screen behind me. God created the world and he created it simply through his word. He spoke creation into being. We read, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Christians disagree, of course, whether the earth was made in six lots of 24 hours or whether it creation involved some form of evolution over much longer periods of time. But whatever the process, this is clear. We can affirm that God made the world out of nothing. He simply spoke creation into being. Secondly, God rules sovereignly over the world. Human beings, as part of God's creation, are part of his divine plans. Verse 12 tells us that God's plans had a particular focus. That is to save people who will become his people. Just as God created through his word, so he also rules through his word. Verse 11, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. And thirdly, God cares for his creation. The writer of this psalm uses several different words that mean the same thing. He says that God sees, he watches, he considers all of his creation. God sees everything, even our hearts. These days, a lot of security cameras... You get the train into town and then get off at Wynyard and then we'll walk up, say, through the QVB building up towards Town Hall. By the time you got to Town Hall, I reckon you would have been spotted by scores of different cameras. There's a lot of cameras around. They monitor much of what we do. 
but they don't see everything. But God does. He sees every aspect of our lives and he even sees into our hearts the things that we can conceal from others. And here's the amazing news of the gospel. Even though he sees all that sin in our lives and in our hearts, he still loves us. Psalm 33 reminds us that God watches over us in love. Verse 18, But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. One outworking of believing in this great God is that we don't need to live without hope. We can have hope in him and his sovereign control of the world. The creator, the almighty ruler over all history. So that when we face the inevitable difficult times, we can trust him. He's our shield and our help. He will keep us and deliver us. If not in this life, then in the life to come. Lake Mungo is in Mungo National Park. It appears prominently on the maps of Mungo National Park. I, when we were out there a few weeks ago, I looked forward to seeing it. There's a, a map of it up there. When we arrived, I went to the National Park's office and asked, was there any water in Lake Mungo? No, she said. Oh, I said. When did it last have water in it? I was hoping that we hadn't missed it by a week or two. She said, last had water? 16,000 years ago. <laughs> I was a little curious as to why they still called it a lake. But you see, in the sweep of history, that is just the blink of an eye. We, we live in our context, in our short span, but that is just a blip in terms of God's view, his eternal view, in affirming our faith as God the creator and ruler. We do not mean that God created the universe and then left it undertended like some giant clockmaker who created the world and wound it up and then is now just letting it unwind. No, we believe in a God who is still intricately personally involved in his world, even if he operates on a time frame that's so beyond our understanding. Modern Western culture is going through a phase now which is not just non-Christian, but in many instances anti-Christian. And a look at the secular media would give you ample evidence of that. So we need to be realistic about the hostile attitudes that, as Christians, we will face. But remember, friends, whether or not there is strong opposition to what we believe doesn't mean it's true or false. Can I encourage you, as we have this morning already, to be praying for our new Archbishop Kanishka. He has an extraordinarily challenging job ahead of him in this context, in this increasingly antagonistic world. The Apostles' Creed that you declare, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Two related outworkings of our trust, of our belief, must be that we trust in God for all aspects of our lives. And secondly, and related to that, we are committed to him. I wonder, are you a worrier? Do you worry about things? Do you stress about aspects of your life? It's, it's kind of hard to avoid worrying sometimes, isn't it? When you get particular health news or there's relationship issues, or you face some employment issue, it's hard not to worry. But let's think about this. 
if God really loves you, which is what we declare, as our Heavenly Father, and He is absolutely in control of every aspect of His creation in your life, do you really need to worry? As the Americans say, He's got this. God is in control. Christians stating the creed are not putting their trust in their ability to trust, but in the object of their trust. God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of that letter puts it this way. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And then that passage closes with a catalogue of all the extraordinary women and men of faith throughout the ages. Hebrews encourages us believers to endure hardship. Reminds us that God disciplines us for our good because he loves us. What we are called to do in response is commitment. An outworking of the faith that we declare we have. To declare I believe in God is to declare that I am committed to God. To believe in God is to belong to God to allow him to be present with us, to guide us, to support us, to challenge us, to shape us, to change us, to rule over every aspect of our lives, to throw open the front door of our lives and invite God in, not merely as a guest, but as Lord and Master. What does that look like? It means that we will trust in God even when things aren't going according to our plan even when life is really very difficult. We will trust in God in managing the minor things, like coping with these ongoing COVID restrictions and the changes, and in the major things, like dealing with a terminal illness or the loss of a loved one, and all stations in between. I believe in God, who is the creator and ruler, He is also the Father who watches over his children in love. And in that is real hope, real peace, real joy, knowing that God is in control. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, that you are the Almighty Father, the maker of heaven and earth, Thank you for the love you have for each one of us, and that is unconditional. Love that meant you sent your son to die for us so that we can be reconciled to you. Help us to live in a way that demonstrates that we believe in you, living lives of hope and joy and not worry, knowing of your fatherly goodness and love and control over your world. Amen. Paul, thank you very much indeed, very much. Our final hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
that be next week. We can all sing. And now, as we depart, may we say to one another the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.